Uh, let's take a look now at uh, some of our leading stories in the world of business. And for this, as well as some market moves, we're joined by Petri Riedelinghes from Herenia Capital Advisors. Uh, Petri, a very good morning to you. Thanks for your time this morning. Uh, perhaps let's start off by reflecting on the markets and, and how they performed yesterday. Uh, good morning, and thank you for, for chatting to me. So, yeah, I mean, a bit of a strange day yesterday, really. Um, our market kind of recovered near the end. Uh, so we ended up down only 30 basis points, 0.3 of a percent. However, for the majority of the days, it was relatively tough. I mean, um, we were down around 1% at some point. Uh, it's been a strange couple of days, right? I mean, if we look at um, uh, if we look at how Wednesday performed, we had quite a strong day. But Tuesday, man, I haven't seen the market perform that badly in a very, very long time. Uh, so. A strange performance coming from the market over the last couple of days. So yesterday being down again, I guess doesn't really make too much, uh, or, uh, doesn't really too much of a surprise. Uh, we saw the U.S. markets also come under a little bit of pressure last night as well. Uh, so I would expect that probably we continue to see a bit further downside uh, today, sort of heading into the weekend, if you will. Um, I think what we have is that situation where. Um, you know, we've got geopolitical tension around the world as well as, you know, the um, so much evidence really of slowing economic activity globally. Uh, you know, data from China, for example. Uh, last night we had uh, the Fed chair, uh, Jerome Powell, uh, essentially bringing markets down with some of his comments, saying that they're not really, uh, you know, anywhere near, um, or if they're actually him, um, Quote directly, he said he's not confident that we've achieved the stance to hit 2% inflation. In other words, he's signaling to the market that they're going to continue to hike interest rates in the US. Uh, and this bringing markets down, of course, because it's probably going to add quite a bit of pressure still um, to, uh, to equities. So we saw that, you know, quite a strong reaction coming from the bond market in the US. Uh, we saw the RAND weakening on the back of that. We saw the gold price lifting a little bit, and we saw US equities coming off. Um, so I think that we probably continue to see, you know, volatile and challenging markets. Um, the U.S. is adamant by the looks of things to continue to hike interest rates, and the rest of the world will have to follow suit. So it's going to be tough still, I think. Mm, certainly uh, looks like it's, 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 a long, it's a long way ahead, um, far from any stabilization at all during these very volatile times uh, with geopolitics especially being uh, the way it is. But let's look at some market results, um, uh, Petri. Starting off with SAPI, the, the, the paper and pulp company, they released their year end uh, to September. And uh, take us through their, their performance. I mean, their profits plunged by more than 50%. What happened there? Look, it's a bit of a mixed bag, really. So the profit number obviously plunged and missed, right, expectations. But everything else actually did really well. Uh, if you look at revenue, was higher. Um, they've managed to pay down debt faster than what was anticipated. The management has a target of to keep debt around $1 billion, which is an enormous amount, right? But uh, if you consider that they're actually quite a large international business, um, and they've managed to reduce the debt by something like 80 million US dollars uh, over the last year. That's kind of coming in line with what management's plan was for um, you know, the debt levels that they are comfortable with. Um, and then also they've uh, essentially started to increase the dividend again, right? Uh, which is something that they haven't done in a very long time. I think the last dividend they paid uh, was, well, I guess in January, uh, which wasn't um, you know, too massive. But uh, what they'll be doing is increasing the size of that dividend um, that they paid. I mean, if they paid a dividend in January and prior to that, the dividend just before that was January 2019. So it took them uh, essentially a four year break from paying dividends. Uh, so then they paid one early this year uh, and they'll be increasing the size of that dividend uh, coming. Uh, you know, sort of the final dividend coming later this year. So that is truly encouraging, I think, for uh, shareholders, right? Um, so, I mean, investors, long-term investors essentially buy shares for the cash flow that you can earn from them, for the income that you can make from them. Uh, so the fact that they are returning to paying dividends after four years and now increasing that dividend um, is encouraging. So, yes, the profit margins are down, 
but that is because a lot of these, um, you know, a lot of that profit is being spent on paying down debt uh, and reorganizing the balance sheet a little bit so that the company is in a better financial position. Every other metric really did well. I mean, I think that their sales were up something like 8%. Mm. Um, so they actually did relatively well, even though profit was down. I think profit was down by $40 million, but they reduced debt by $80 million. So if they sort of are comfortable with the debt levels that they've had previously, they would have done a lot better, except they're paying that down. Uh, and, 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 and I so, guess the reduction yeah. as well in, in whatever interest that would have been paid on that debt, um, that also bodes well then for, for the company. But I also want to look at Truett's International. Uh, the group released their retail sales for the first 17 weeks uh, of, of the 2024 uh, financial period, but a very different performance um, on the international market uh, versus the, the local, local market. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so I think if you look at the UK numbers, they did relatively well in uh, shoe sales, right? Um, which is, I guess, encouraging. But, uh, you know, I think also what's happening there is they're still kind of making inroads into that market in a sense. Um, so there's some sales growth there. Uh, locally is really, I guess, where the focus of the market was or is. Um, you know, it's where they make quite a bit of their uh, revenue. Um, and that, you know, saw them, you know, declined by around 8%. So they sold 8% fewer items or, um, you know, 8% lower sales, which is relatively bad, right? So the share was down 3.72%. Uh, and I think that you can see that this is really just a reflection of the current economic condition in South Africa where, uh, you know, we're struggling, man. Like, it's really hard out there, right? Um, and if you consider that true, this is generally a credit retailer. So what generally happens is, uh, during the hard times like now, uh, interest rates are going up, you know, it's really not a great economic situation, people are struggling. Uh, people tend to move away from credit retailers and move on to sort of cash retailers. So people like Mr. Price, for example, would absorb some of the sales that Truworths would be losing um, because it's probably better for me to pay cash uh, than what it would be to pay, you know, to put it on credit because I'm not necessarily sure what the future holds and interest rates are really high. So it's better for me to buy cheaper products uh, for cash, right? So you see that transition taking place generally. So I'd be keen to see what, um, you know, the results for uh, Mr. Price would look like as an example for, you know, comparison. Um, but generally what we can see is that these retailers, particularly the clothing retailers, um, are, are under pressure and they're really struggling. And I think that that's indicative of the rest of the country and the rest of the economy. I think we were having yeah. this conversation about mining production the other day. Yeah. Um, you know, mining production being lower, uh, as mining production goes, so goes the rest of the economy, right? And, um, and talking about the mining market. production, I mean, their output uh, fell, fell 2%. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, and some of the reasons cited there uh, is obviously load shedding is the obvious one, right? Um, but also uh, some of the other reasons cited for that is uh, deteriorating road, rail, and port infrastructure. Um, essentially, we we can't export the stuff because we can't get it to the ports on time, or the ports can't get it out the country on time. And we've seen that, uh, you know, some of the, um, for example, that some of the mining companies have have to make you know, alter alternative arrangements is they have to sort of send it to Maputo to be exported from there. Uh, well, obviously it's exported when it crosses the border into Mozambique, but uh, to use that port to get it onto the boats, right? Uh, the, the, the produce, the iron ore or the manganese or whatever there else. So essentially, even though the mining companies probably could be producing more, uh, they're not because they can't sell their product fast enough because they can't transport their product fast enough. Um, and similarly, obviously, there is then the production uh, interruptions that take place because of the unstable uh, electricity supply. Um, so, yeah, it's really a tough environment, right? And I think that it's going to be difficult to find companies that are really thriving in this environment. Um, yeah, it certainly is. I, don't um, want to I, I think we're going to have to leave it um, at that uh, for this uh, morning, Pedro.